I am a uh, historical clarinet specialist and I teach mo both modern and historical clarinet at the University of Auckland. And today I'm going to be talking about how learning the historical clarinet can improve your modern clarinet playing both technically and musically. Um, and of course there's a few uh, interesting technical aspects that really affect the musical and creative side of, of playing. And as I'm sure most of us are aware, um, the two go really hand in hand. So um, I'm going to be sort of trying to connect those two aspects of, of what we do artistically um, and sort of the aspects of our clarinet life and how that can change and be influenced by a knowledge of or even a study of and uh, of historical clarinet and maybe getting your hands dirty a little bit if you ever have the opportunity. Um, so I'll start with one of the technical aspects um, because it's much more tangible and practical. Um, and, uh, and that would be um, sound production. First thing that we start off with on all clarinets, sound production. Um, and what's interesting about the historical clarinet, and by the way, this is, it's sort of almost like a follow-up to, um, to a presentation I gave at the ICA Plays On conference in uh, earlier in the year in the end of January and I think that should be still up on YouTube uh, if you want to check it out and that presentation um, was a much longer one about the Mozart clarinet concerto and how that um, your modern playing can be influenced by by uh, historical clarinet and and uh, having a knowledge of how the Mozart would have been played on the original instrument um, and so this one it's it's uh, it's really sort of an extension of that presentation. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. Um, but the historical clarinet, as I demonstrated quite a lot in that original presentation, is um, does not let you get away with bad habits. Like the modern clarinet lets you get away with some bad habits and you can still sound quite decent and actually quite good. Um, but things start to suffer and little problems seep in. Um, and one of the things I've found about playing the historical clarinet is it really does not allow you to have any of these little bad habits that we can get away with on the, uh, on the modern clarinet. So it's quite good in that way to, for students to start learning it because what they do is they develop a lot of proper technique through playing it because it demands that. Um, and some of these things, some of the bad habits I'm talking about would be like biting. Uh, tension that can creep in all throughout your body and um, of course breath support not supporting um, properly um, this clarinet really doesn't let you do any of those things what's what's uh, most obvious is just to start off with is tension so interestingly enough all the classical um, and earlier instruments work in the same way and that is um, if you force too much or if you use a setup that's a little bit too hard, which I also consider like a form of forcing, um, or if, if you're, um, yeah, biting again, like I'm talking about, if anything is forced or too hard or overblown, uh, you get no sound, actually. So I'm gonna demonstrate a couple of reeds, our favorite things here. Um, on, the, on the early clarinet, when I started playing, I came from number five, Van Doren clarinet reads on the uh, modern clarinet. And I was told that uh, we should play, what's best to play is one and a half. And uh, I normally give demonstrations and presentations about historical clarinets, where I demonstrate quite a lot of instruments. Um, today I'm just gonna be showing this one, but uh, sometimes we get into what kind of reeds it uses. And it, yes, they actually do make one and a half Van Doren reeds. These are not, uh, the same as you play on your modern French clarinet. They are German reeds, um, which are a bit different. They're a different cut, they're a different size. Um, and uh, so it's, they're, they're much different uh, responding. But of course, having a one and a half, which is the weakest reed that Van Doren makes, it's quite flexible. So, um, so as you can see here, also, I'm not going to go into all the details because I've, I've been into it on that previous presentation for ICA, ICA, but the materials here, obviously the first thing you notice about a historical clarinet, the materials are quite different. So the materials 
really dictate the sound. Um, this is boxwood, it's not blackwood. It's very light material, wooden mouthpiece. Um, and you'll see I've tied the reed on here with a piece of string. Um, so not a big metal or leather ligature yet. Now, if I, if I start to play, this is a reed that's um, quite, quite decent and, and it's not at all too thick. So this is just my, my diatonic scale, C major scale. And um, if you know anything about historical clarinet, the notes in between, so the chromatic notes, uh, are not, they don't have the same tone quality. So they all have a different, their own different timbre and tone. And uh, interestingly enough, the composers at that time were using these different timbres and tones as an expressive device. So they were writing for those. Um, and now, on the, on the early clarinet, if you, if you have too hard of a read, those, those notes, the chromatic notes, which are often a little bit stuffy, they won't come out at all. So this is where you, you, you would get silence if you have a read that's too hard. Now this is read is quite, as I said, is quite good. So I can show you um, a chromatic scale. So I'm playing, as you see, I have some strange fingerings here, um, but uh, it's because obviously the, the lack of keys. But um, as I am playing uh, these, cr what we call cross fingerings, which are the strange fingerings like that, where you've got to go cross um, with odd fingerings, it's not like Burm's system where every finger lifts up. So as I'm playing these uh, notes, you'll, you'll hear that they're fuzzier, but they still come out clearly. Um, and some of the most fuzzy ones, the A flat and the F sharp and the B flat, so these ones there, there you can tell that they have a different timbre, but they come out clearly. Now, if I play a reed, and this is the same strength, one and a half size reed, I play another one here. That sounds, it's almost cutting it. It's, it's quite a good read, um, but the problem is, is that it's just a bit too thick. It's a hair too hard, a too thick, a little bit too much material there. So when I put this on, what you'll notice is that the, uh, the cross fingerings don't speak. And now even to get the cross fingerings out on a very good read, I have to let go of tension. And when I, when I came from number five on the reeds, Van Dorn reeds on the uh, modern clarinet to go into one and a half, you can imagine that that consisted of some retraining of the embouchure. It actually, it took weeks to retrain my embouchure to let go of that tension and that jaw pressure. As um, many of you probably know, the jaw is the m strongest muscle in the human body. So this biting and the jaw pressure um, of, of making that hard read make a sound, um, that's actually quite, it's something that's significant that you have to let go of. Now, as I demonstrate this one, I'll try to show you that the, the same chromatic notes, the cross fingerings, don't really come out. This read is a little bit too hard. So that's the diatonic scale. It sounds good, right? It sounds, it sounds basically the same as the other one. Now if I play the chromatic, and I almost get a squeak there actually. And it, sometimes it just sounds like air blowing through. That means that my reed is too hard actually, even though the clear notes the notes of the most of the notes of the C major scale sound clear. It doesn't let you play on a on a reed that's even a touch too hard. It sort of rejects it and and uh, and bounce it bounces back at you. It doesn't really let you make the sounds. Now, interestingly enough, if you if you go to a classical forte piano and just bang it really hard, you get the same thing: silence. Um, so you get this kind of tonk. Uh, instead of a note, instead of a tone. 
And all of the, all of the instruments from the classical era work like that. Um, so as, as you can imagine, everything has to be quite open uh, with, a, with a very thin and flexible reed um, in order to make these different sounds. And uh, the sounds are, are really quite an important part, as I was mentioning, of the style. And, uh, and, and playing with weak reeds like this and really letting go of this tension, letting go of physical tension actually all over your body when, when, you, um, when you don't have to put much effort in to make a sound, when making a sound is just effortless. Um, you lose a lot of that tension, and at least for myself, that is totally carried over into modern clarinet playing. A lot of bad habits and a lot of um, even tension that came from mental blocks uh, was just released after um, after playing a clarinet that was so free blowing, so easy to play, and um, yeah. So that's that's the the first thing about it is that. Um, there's just absolutely no sound if it's forced. Um, and on modern clarinet, what I, what I notice a lot of players do, um, especially recently, I think in recent years with so many, uh, with the evolution of modern clarinet, with the instrument changing, the instrument becoming bigger, with the, with the invention of the, the Tosca clarinets and the bigger clarinets, all the boutique makers who are making these um, very dark, big uh, sounding instruments. Um, what's happened is that's gone in a different direction and they've got this, at least when I play them, I find that they've got this resistance and the, that resistance doesn't necessarily let you uh, make, it gives you a big, nice, rich, dark sound, which we all want to begin with, right? But um, as, as you learn when you make instruments, when you make clarinets, and as you study the evolution of the clarinet, Every time you quote unquote gain something, every time there's an improvement, as we like to think of it, uh, you give up something else. So every, there's something sacrificed for everything that's gained, <coughs> um, no matter what that is. If that's different tone colors, or if it's um, colors of sound, or if it's intonation, which happens a lot with clarinet building. Um, what happens is that uh, is that on those very resistant setups, the number five reeds, the big mouthpieces, uh, the, um, the big clarinets, even the instruments that are much more resistant, um, what you get is a big, nice, dark, rich sound, but uh, you lose the flexibility and the different sound colors. Um, so it's, it's uh, and it can be accomplished, of course, but it takes much more effort. So it's, again, it's this, um, this requirement of effort. And, um, and on, on a lighter setup, it's much more easy. I like to sort of think of it as driving in a car. You know, so we have a very old uh, 1990s Toyota Corolla. And if you want to go faster or go up the hill on it, you've got to really push your foot down on the gas and not much difference happens. You can sort of, eventually she gets up the hill. But um, if, of course, if you get into a new car, you push down a little bit and it's like, whoa, it goes way off, especially if you're used to driving in the old Toyota Corolla, right? We've probably all had that experience. Um, but the response is totally different. Um, and it's, it can be like that on those clarinets. Sometimes the big, rich, dark, resistant setups can, um, you pay for it in other ways. If you, if, you, if you blow a lot of air, you get a tiny little crescendo or you get not as much of a crescendo or not as much uh, very, very nuanced uh, dynamics as you would on a lighter setup uh, without all of that tension. And um, of course, that uh, the setup being thicker and bigger uh, will affect other parts of the playing. Tension will affect other parts of the playing, like articulation. Um, so having a lighter setup, of course, allows you to have a faster articulation. And what I've discovered with this, when I was a student playing modern clarinet only, exclusively, before I came to period clarinet, um, I thought I had a slow tongue, slowish compared to some of my classmates who could just tongue like crazy, sounding like double tongue, but, but doing single tongue, right? Um, but when I came to this, all my tonguing sort of woes and mental blocks disappeared because of the setup was so light, uh, I could just tongue 
very, very fast and quick. And what I realized what was slowing me down was that hard, resistant setup, which was giving me this gorgeous sound, but there was, again, a payoff. Um, and the other thing that, that can be uh, affected by this hard setup is um, breathing, of course. So making long phrases, long breaths. Um, what's interesting is uh, if you think about Schubert, the uh, Unfinished Symphony, the second movement, you've got this big, long A clarinet solo. And uh, I've heard, when I was a student, I heard a lot of players saying, oh, Schubert didn't know how to write for the clarinet. Why well, he's written nowhere to breathe. Where do you breathe in this thing? The reason is, on this clarinet, you don't have to breathe in the solo. You can play a lot longer on one breath than you can on a bigger clarinet with a more, much more resistant setup. So a lot, a lot of times the music as it's written starts to make sense when you come at it from the perspective of playing the original instrument. Um, there's quite a nice story that, uh, that I like also relating to, um, to another composer, uh, Schumann, and uh, it comes from an oboe colleague of mine in Europe, and uh, we were playing Schumann Piano Concerto, and he says, oh, but, but Schumann's got written all these triple piano in low Cs, which are very, you know, you have to honk it out on the oboe to get it to speak. And, and oboe players think, of course, again, Schumann didn't know how to write for the oboe because he's written something that's not really possible. But as soon as he, he once ordered a, he got an old, uh, old romantic 18th, 19th century, late 19th century oboe off of eBay. And um, it had in it a, uh, a historical read. Um, and so he, you know, took a chance and soaked it for a while and gave it a play. It sounded kind of like a duck, but, and everybody sort of, he came and demonstrated it for us one time before the rehearsal and everybody laughed, but he could play that C triple piano and, uh, and it worked. So it's really, um, as we develop this different setup, we lose the ability to do some of these expressive things um, that they would have done in the time if in the name of rich, big, dark tone, you know, on all of the instruments. This is not just exclusively a clarinet thing. I mean, we laugh at the duck-like oboe uh, sounds when we, when we listen to, to early 20th century recordings, but they could do a lot of things that, um, that we can't do today. So there is, again, trade-off. Um, and these things relate directly to musical style. So talking about the creative aspects of playing, um, just as a quick aside, what is style? I think a lot, that's a word that we use a lot that um, a lot of people don't quite, maybe don't quite realize what it is. It's simple to explain. It's basically how music would have been interpreted in the time. So classical re style refers to how, how they would have interpreted the music in the classical era. And a lot of times that has to do with how the notation would have been interpreted in the time. Um, so style is really just about how, um, sometimes it has to do with notation. Like, um, for instance, in, from, even from Schubert and before, the hairpins would have been, um, just as an example, would have been not only dynamic markings, but would have been tempo markings and rubato markings as well. So um, a lot of times how we interpret in notation would have changed. Um, and of course, it has to do with phrasing, how the phrases were structured. Now in classical style, you have a lot more shorter um, phrases, and this comes from the instruments. It comes from the light materials of the instruments, so again, the weak reed, very thin reed. The light materials, the soft and intimate sound uh, that the instruments make, and so there wasn't a lot of big crescendos until later on. Um, but in Mozart, there weren't a lot of big crescendo crescendos through eight bars because the instruments didn't want to sustain that. They had all these different timbres and you heard the, the fuzzy notes that wouldn't sustain through a big crescendo. So, um, and a lot of it, of course, was influenced by string playing, by bows that would have been weighted differently, would have been much heavier on the frog of the bow and much lighter at the tip. So there was, as you did a bow, there was an, a natural decay. Um, and wind players, of course, uh, copied that. They copied that sound. So it was, it was the, the style and the way of playing, way of phrasing, 
was highly influenced by the instruments themselves. Um, and if we want to understand classical style as modern players, it's so important to actually hear the instruments, to hear what they sound like, to hear what, um, I think a lot of people think of historical performance as a set of rules. And it's actually not like that at all. <clears throat> but to hear these, um, hear these concepts or these aspects of the style um, done, done in, in, but really by these instruments and not just by modern players uh, trying, to, trying to copy something that would have originally come from here. <coughs> and the, the, the style is quite, is quite n nuanced and it's quite, there's a, quite a lot of complexity. And of course, these boundaries are set by the material that the composer gives us, the harmonies, um, the, the shape of the melody and everything like that, as we all know. But, um, but within that, there's, um, there's a lot of nuance in the, in the style and in, in the phrasing. And uh, sometimes just reading about it in a book, um, what, what players end up doing is exaggerating these co this concept of rules and everything becomes more black and white. Whereas if you really, um, if you really study it and read about it and do it through, a, through an experimentation with the instruments, the phrasing starts to just become much more uh, natural and intrinsic and it makes much more sense than sort of thinking about it abstractly and uh, trying, to trying to come around it by that way. Um, as you play the style on these instruments, of course, it becomes much more, uh, much more just natural. And the thing about the, the earlier periods of playing, the earlier styles, even the rom romantic style, was much more natural. And romantic style, of course, didn't have a lot of metronome. There was a lot of freedom in it. And uh, all the, the things that you want to do naturally are sort of allowed in that style. Um, so that's, uh, it's all just, it's very, um, very much linked to the instrument. Um, so the other thing about, about studying, uh, studying historical instruments that's important to, to, to think about is that um, we, we gain a, an understanding of the context of the periods. Because, um, of course, I, this is actually a romantic uh, 1820s, early, early, early romantic style of clarinet, but it has a few more keys than my five key clarinet, which I would play for Mozart. And, uh, and then again, as we get into 1840s, there's another clarinet again, and uh, there's everything in between. Um, so many clarinets existed, and uh, in, my, in my career, I'm playing so many different types of clarinets with different types of key systems uh, that it becomes... Um, of course, you develop a real flexibility and you develop the ability to adjust to any instrument and maybe instruments that aren't sealing and aren't doing so well. But what you also do is, more importantly, is that you um, discover how, how the instruments are related to the music and how, uh, how they would have thought about music differently in the context of, um, of that period. And... Um, how the playing styles would have evolved. So something that I actually wasn't even really consciously aware of, it seems, might seem quite obvious, uh, but as a student, when I, when I was playing modern clarinet, everything was sort of played in the same style, and I wasn't, uh, I wasn't really keyed in on different stylistic aspects between periods even, or between composers. But what I discover as I play um, Mozart and Beethoven, and sometimes playing Mozart and Beethoven on two different clarinets, um, and what I discover about that is that they had very different musical languages, and they start to even have a different style. So Beethoven, of course, starts to get into a uh, romantic style, and you can feel that through the writing and through the playing and through how the clarinet reacts to the music. Um, What's interesting is that Mozart, of course, has very small, uh, short, light, decaying phrases, and Beethoven starts to push more through the instrument, um, starts to push crescendos, longer crescendos. And uh, those are they're two very different musical languages. And uh, as a modern player, I just thought, oh, it's all classical music, right? It's Mozart and Beethoven, the two sort of go together. 
but they had totally two different, totally different languages. And um, thinking about these two composers in the context of uh, playing in a period style on a period instrument, you really start to notice um, differences in the music and differences in how the music would have been played at the time. Now, it's, what's interesting is um, sometimes we like to think about music from our perspective, which is just so, so, so far away from how, from how they would have thought about uh, music at the time. Of course, you think society is totally different. The world is totally different. Um, most things about the world are different. So you think they must have had a totally different musical society and context in which these pieces existed when they were written. Um, one time I, I took a look, I was asked to take a look at a, uh, a, a post-grad thesis um, by, by a student who had been studying a little bit of, of historical clarinet next to his modern clarinet. And uh, what he did in this thesis was he counted up the cross-fingering notes, which I showed you, and um, he, count, he literally took a, some classical concerto, Stamitz or somebody, and counted up the, um, the cross-fingering notes, which he called bad notes, um, and to, to, to show, to try and show how, um, how often they use these notes and how, how much, uh, whether they use them freely or not when they wrote for this instrument. And that's, that might make sense in a modern context. We'd think about, oh, were these, were these bad notes really used or not? Or how much did they, did they want to write for notes like this or in timbres like this? And of course, when you step back and think about it, Mozart wrote for chromatic notes all the time on the clarinet. Um, and it doesn't really make sense because at the time they wouldn't have thought about those as bad notes. They would have thought about those as a note that expressed a different character, a different color, and they would have used them. Mozart used those notes to express uh, different emotions, sadness, uh, melancholy, and they used the fuzziness of those and made them into dissonances in a very interesting way. And Beethoven used the same notes uh, differently, again, to express tension, to express something that was the instrument not responding and the player pushing it through. So they didn't think about those as notes that didn't work because, of course, that's all they knew, and they used those notes. So what we, what we do is... Um, is uh, we, c we come at it from this other perspective. If you come at it from a perspective of the time and you immerse yourself, like a language, like if you learn another language and you immerse yourself in the culture of that country, you gain an entirely different perspective than if you study it from the outside. Um, and that actually meant to lead me into um, a little bit of an example. So if I have... Um, if I have the Rossini, I can pull it up here. I'm sure many of you know this piece. Uh, let me just pull it up. Okay. So I can show you a little bit of what it looks like on the screen. Um, this is the be beginning of the Rossini introduction theme and variations. And uh, this is one that comes up, that has come up. It's an interesting example that I've found through my own teaching. Um, and I'm just going to demonstrate a little bit of, of it on the modern clarinet for a minute. Just looking at the first, what is that? Not even two bars. Um, just actually looking at the first exact two bars. So I hear many players and many students, and there's, I'm sure many of you can point to famous recordings by famous players where they play the opening quite legato. quite a lot. I get that when I teach students. When, when the student comes in with the piece, they, they like to play it like that. Um, and if you take this piece from a historical perspective, so after many, many years of studying historical, uh, historically informed performance, I look at that and I would have said, no way is the beginning legato. Um, what I see when I see that opening riff, the CCFA, uh, is, is something that's very fanfare-like. And what, what brought that to my mind is a little bit of a knowledge of the um, historical brass instruments. 
Now, the historical instruments like horn and trumpet, they didn't have the valves and the keys on them that we have today. So they played, um, they played in a way where the notes of the harmonic series, like the C, E, G, the triad, are open. Those are dun 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 dun. Those are the, the, the open notes. So you hear that oftentimes um, in symphonic and opera writing, a lot of open notes on the brass. And it's often fanfare, right? It's often sort of uh, big fanfare type music. And that would never have been played legato. If we think about brass fanfares, we don't think, and announcing something, we don't think about legato playing. And we don't think about the sort of legato character that I just played the opening of this piece with. Um, so when I see this CFA, right, um, I think about brass instruments, how they would have worked at the time. Um, very fanfare-esque, right? And then I think about what I want to bring out uh, in a lot of this music, in a lot of classical, a lot of any music really, is um, contrast, right? So I want to think about contrast, and the more contrast I can bring out, and especially in Rossini, if you know any Rossini opera, even I, I always think of the most famous Voice Sapete. Uh, no, no, Voice Sapete, that's Mozart. Uh, I think of the, the famous aria from uh, the Barber Seville, right? Um, and uh, she, where she starts out saying, um, saying, uh, "Oh, I'm always a good girl. I'm always, I'm always sweet and nice, until I'm not, right?" And so it's these two very different characters. So if you start out with a fanfare and then you have the legato after, you've got the contrast. So if I start a very brass fanfare type, you know, brass, natural brass without the valves, I'm thinking of. If you start a very brass fanfare, and then you've got the legato on the chromatic notes, which are much more sneaky, charming, coquette, coquettish, right? That's, a, that's the sense of the character in the chromatic dissension there. Um, what you have is something that, that is uh, more full of contrast, more, more full of historical historically informed sort of a character, um, and just always looking for these different types of interpretations. Um, ultimately, just in closing, and we've got to go in a minute, but just in closing, uh, ultimately what you get from a study of historical instruments is what, or what I've gotten, I can speak to, is um, a creative sense of freedom. Um, I'm not locked into the traditional the traditional way of playing anymore, um, where somebody tells you how to play it and there's one accepted interpretation. What historical performance does is it unlocks all of these kind of possibilities um, and it, it lets you just interpret in a lot of different ways. Of course, it lets you or do things like ornamentation, which is giving you much more of a sense of freedom. And uh, what you learn from it actually is a framework the framework of a style, of a style, stylistic period. Um, I'm always reminded of, there's a documentary called Dancer, about a very famous Russian dancer, Sergei Polonin, uh, who's sort of this amazing young prodigy. And there's an interview with someone who says, uh, when he played, when he danced in the Royal Ballet in London, that he, they said, um, every night I went to see him dance, and he always followed the rules of classical ballet, but every night it was different. Sort of like he, he interpreted everything differently within this framework, night after night. And so we think of sort of having, having this framework and having rules as limiting, but it's actually freeing. Once you understand the framework, you can play within that. And the problem is if you don't under, understand the stylistic framework, um, or how music would have been performed, uh, you can't really play with it much. And you don't have the tools or the ability to play inside that much. Once you have these tools, you can ornament, you can improvise your cadenzas, you can do all of this kind of things that, uh, that performers would have done, that would have given, given so much freedom. And it's this sort of knowledge of the framework that actually like sort of takes the handcuffs, the artistic handcuffs off. And, um, gives you the ability to, uh, to play creatively inside, inside the rules, the rules, 
I hate this word, and the boundaries of what the, uh, the classical composers are, have, have given you. So, all right, that's a little bit of sort of an introduction of what you can learn from historical uh, clarinet. The, so, um, is there any questions? Hi, Jessica. Hi, that was great. Um, I have a question. I would like to know if you have any resources that you can recommend for players that are interested in sort of getting their feet wet dipping their toes in a historical performance um well historical performance yes there, do you have any resources at all any any <laughs> yeah there's heaps there's heaps um one is for people interested in the clarinet of course there's the book the clarinet by eric Hoprich, which is the classic talking about um styles periods uh there's clive there's the classic Clive Brown book about classical and romantic performance styles. And I can show you, there's, I've got another one right here. Um, this book is quite nice. It's called, it's a lot, it's um, some of what I was talking about today. Bruce Haynes, The End of Early Music. And he's just talking about how our, um, our society is quite different than how they would have learned classical music and how we, we have this very limited uh, canon of repertoire and uh, how we're obsessed with, st with playing the right notes on the right page. And, um, and not really, that's not how they would have played music at all. So it's quite an interesting book. Um, and then the clarinet, um, Classical and Romantic Performing Practices by Clive Brown. What else is good? I mean, then you get into really intricate, you, you can have many, many books about Mozart, many books about Brahms. Of course, there's the classic Colin Lawson book about the Mozart concerto, which there's a whole section on style there, which is quite clearly lined out. I actually love that one. I give that one to my um, historical performance students because it's so clear. And um, as, as far as anything else, um, I'd recommend getting an instrument from somewhere. Maybe your university has one. Many universities have some locked away in a dark dungeon somewhere. Um, getting your hands on one, or you can get some actually quite inexpensively secondhand on the internet, do a search, even eBay. It doesn't have to be uh, brilliant. It doesn't have to be perfect. Even getting something that makes a few notes um, that you can play all the notes on, doesn't have to play in tune. Just getting something, you can get something for maybe one, two hundred dollars on eBay. Try it out, right? Try out a repad of it. You know, try, it's quite easy to repad these instruments. Um, just muck around with it, is, make some experimentation is uh, quite a good way if you, want to, if you want to start. Like I said, many institutions have these instruments. Um, even museums might let you play some, some at some places. Um, so there's, there's a lot of ways, or you can borrow some from a, a lot of players have quite a few clarinets, not thinking of anybody in particular. Um, but uh, yeah, so a lot of players might let somebody who's interested borrow it or um, have a go at it, you know? So um, yeah, it, just getting your hands on an in instrument is always gonna be uh, so much more enlightening than reading about it in a book, I think. But of course, books are amazing as well. It gives you a different type of perspective. Does anyone else have any questions for Marie as we wrap up here? I also just want to quickly recommend Marie's um, album um, with the Brahms sonatas and the, the trio. It's such a treat. It's it's such a beautiful interpretation um, so far, but so close at the same time. The, the, the interpretation to me is is really inspiring because it's it's so different than what we're so used to hearing, as she mentions, talking about the Western instrument and the modern instruments just being so loud and so, you know, boisterous in the way that they sound, even in these pieces, when the instruments at the time didn't make those sounds. So it's really, really refreshing for the ears to hear that. I will pop the chat for the Spotify um, on there. So you should check oh, it cool. out. Oh, cool. Oh, yeah, that's so great. It's on the, it's on the ICA Spotify list. Yeah, yep. awesome. Um, so I saw a couple other questions. Hmm. Chuck West... Ah, so um, Eileen Raisi says, models of classical clarinets um, are makers. That's actually, they're all, they're all made by hand individually, so there's no models. It's just, um, there's a few makers. This one is by a Dutch maker called Peter van der Poel, who um, has a very, very long waiting list. Uh, so it's, it's not always the most practical maker, but he's amazing. 
Um, and there's another maker that I love to recommend, Soren Green, who has a much, uh, he's American as well, um, so easy to deal with, but he also lives in Holland. Um, but he's got a much shorter wait list if you wanted to, to order something. Um, and ultimately, anybody that you find secondhand clarinet from, um, any maker, it's going to be, it's going to be um, worth experimenting on and then maybe if you get really into it you know you could you could if you decide you want another clarinet from another maker that can come later you can get on a on a wait list like i said uh, peter vanderpool has at least a two and a half year waiting list last time i checked it takes a while to make instruments by hand and it's got lined up um so yeah anything you can get your hands on even i just check like i said ebay and original instruments are quite interesting. They might not play in tune, so you might not be able to play it professionally, but for a hundred bucks, you'd be able to have a pretty significant go on it. Um, reeds. Chuck West asked me about reeds. Um, I mentioned these are the White Master Van Doren. I'm pl I usually, I always play um, on this, the White Master Van Doren one and halves. Like I said, very weak. Um, I also play Gonzales uh, on Basset Horn and some different uh, Mueller system clarinets. I play Gonzales um, twos, I think. Uh, the cane of the Gonzales is quite um, quite uh, weak, which is good for us. Um, and the Gonzales one and a half on basset horn are quite, you need the weakest thing for basset horn to make all those quonky sounds. Um, so yeah, that I'm looking for the weakest read possible. Um, and yeah, the the, uh, the traditional cut and this, of course, the ligature is just a piece of kitchen twine, nothing scientific. But what's funny is different lengths of it and different thicknesses of it um, will affect the sound, just like the modern ligature. All the different little intricacies affect the sound. Um, is that because the mouthpiece is so open and resistant? No, it's because um, the clarinet, uh, the, it's because of the basically the lack of keys and the way that the clarinet is laid out so that you have to have all the cross fingerings uh, and they don't speak very easily. They're stuffy, so you have to really, really let go of everything, taking out all that tension. Um, the mouthpiece is smaller. It's significantly smaller. Let me see if I can hold them up, if you can notice it. I've got my modern one. Ooh, it's a bit yucky. And the, uh, the historical one, they're a bit... You can see, I don't know if you can see it very well. If you saw it in person, you'd see this one is much thicker and longer, and the historical one is um, much, much thinner. But yeah, it's mostly because of how the clarinet itself is designed um, without the keys and how the fingerings work and not having, not having all the holes drilled in it. Um, makes sense. Okay, phew. <laughs> Great, thanks for, thanks for letting me know, Chuck. Um, yeah, so it's uh, it's just it's a very very different instrument. It's it's almost like learning a separate instrument. It's that different. Um, the way of blowing is different. The way of your embouchure is different. Uh, throat's different. Um, the intonation, of course, is something I want to talk about, but never have time. The intonation is very it's very very flexible. So if I play um, on the classical clarinet, I'm tuning every every note. I've got a wide gap of where I place the note, depending on where I am in the chord, of course. But um, it's every note has to be tuned. It's not like I pop fingers down and it works automatically, right? It wasn't like tuned at the factory. It's very, very, very flexible, embouchure-wise, and fingering-wise as well. But there's a much more adjustment with the embouchure. And of course, because of that, the weak setup, you can adjust it all over the place. So it's... Um, it's, it's great, but it's something, it really teaches you to listen and it teaches you how to, how to place notes and how to really control the fine nuances of your embouchure. So it's, um, yeah, it's quite, it's quite a, a workout. It's I saw one other learn. question about um, mm. procurement of mouthpieces. Because oh, right. the size is so different, are there people, um, manufacturers or, or makers that you could recommend? Yeah, um, the mouthpieces are usually, again, like the clarinets, made by hand. And if you find a clarinet, it usually comes with a mouthpiece. So um, that might not, might not be an issue. And the mouthpiece should be made for that particular clarinet. So it's not like you can go out to the mouthpiece store and buy, you know, and it'll fit any instrument. If I, um, if I have a clarinet like this from a maker, 
even no two clarinets that he makes will be the same, even fingerings wise. So with this clarinet, I have to use a certain F sharp fingering that I don't use on another clarinet by the same maker um, because the instruments are that individual. And of course, it requires a lot of technique, uh, a lot of flexibility um, fingerings wise, which I never had on the modern clarinet. I even had, um, I even had difficulty when I was a student using this key this B flat, E flat in the uh, in the chromatic scale. Now I can now I can like I use different fingering systems all the time. So it's um it's yeah the mouthpiece will go along with the clarinet if it's gonna if it's gonna tune. And there's makers who can make a mouthpiece. Sometimes they have to have your clarinet to be able to get the right dimensions. Um, but there's there's people in the states that make mouthpieces. Um, there's people in in the UK. Um, Ed Pillinger is the guy who was making um, cast mouthpieces, hard rubber mouthpieces, and he got, got some historical mouthpiece molds, and, and he can also adjust that to your clarinet. Um, that's one possibility. But I, li um, I also like, I mean, for myself, I like the, the mouthpieces that are made out of wood, which is a historical thing. But um, if you're just going to do it casually, like a hard rubber mouthpiece is probably fine. Um, Let's see what Chuck says. But the mouthpiece is with the likelihood that F. Yes, it will warp eventually. Um, this one I've had for almost 10 years, and it's still my main, main mouthpiece. And that's because I oil it regularly. And if it's oiled well when it's made, it will, it will become much more stable. It's about how it's finished um, when it's first cut. If it stabilizes, then it's much more likely to be stable for years to come. And then if you keep oiling it, properly and don't let it dry out it will um it'll keep it'll it'll be basically stable if you're lucky um there are some exceptions to that of course but uh but yeah so in a way the hard rubber ones are are more reliable but um you do give up some elements of sound uh for that so yeah there's heaps of there's heaps of makers you can even do a google if you're if you guys are interested it's something that's in the internet age, it's all on the internet now. Um, when I started, none of the makers, none of the mouthpiece makers, nobody was on the internet because it was all in Europe and those like old guys that didn't have websites and didn't have email addresses. And uh, you had to sort of track somebody down. And some of those people didn't even have phones. So you're like ringing at their doorbell, can you make me a mouthpiece? And uh, it was crazy. It was crazy. But now all that stuff is on the internet, luckily enough for, for everybody. It's all very um, shareable and they want to be found and they will take your call and your email now, you know. It's, I was talking, when I started it would have been like 2005, 2006. It was really like secret information and you had to go there in person and, uh, and meet the people. But it's not like that anymore. So if you just, you know, Google historical clarinet, Google historical clarinet mouthpiece makers, you know, it's, you'll get lots of websites. Um, again, Soren Green, a cool maker who can, uh, who makes mouthpieces, you just send him like, sometimes you can even send them your barrel so that they can suit it and tell them what kind of clarinet you have. Um, and that can be possible. But uh, yeah, really good mouthpiece makers out there. But there's so many options and of course, like anything with clarinet, I should also add, very personal. Um, and if you think going and choosing, you know, if you imagine going to the buffet factory and choosing, uh, and having like five or 10 of these lined up and they all play very differently, right? And they're supposed to play the same because theoretically they're made in the factories. If you have clarinets like this that are all made by hand, it's all very individual. So it can be that a maker that I like doesn't work for you. You know, and it can be a maker that works for you. I don't, you know, I personally don't like. And some of my closest colleagues, um, we have very different tastes in clarinets, which is great because I'd find something and we'd swap and whatever. So it's um, it's very personal. It's just um, if you if you want to get started, I'd say get anything, and just get started, get stuck into doing it. And if you get more serious along the way, then you can get more serious. You can go and try different clarinets, and then it'll be obvious what to do. But I'd say if you're just getting started, get anything, right? Anything, start making the sounds. Even just experience putting your fingers on the wood, you know, and how, how that sound is made physically is, um, is already like so much, right? 
So you don't have to get into like who's the best mouthpiece maker and stuff like that. It's that can all come later if you decide like you want to do it something something serious. But um, just having the experience of making the sound. The first time I experienced just making the sound on the instrument, it was that blew my mind, and I decided right there I had to had to do it because the the experience of making such a different sound uh, was just incredible, and it it felt physically much different. So um, and just having your fingers uh, there on the raw wood, you know, not on a metal ring, it's already a different experience. So um, yeah, I'd say just find what you can, find anything, and start making sounds on it. You know, even if it doesn't seal, play the notes that do seal. You know, and then figure out how to seal the the rest of the keys. Awesome. Well, this has been an incredible session, and I'm really, really grateful to you taking your time and joining us today. Um, is there a good place to contact you um, if anyone yes. has further questions? Yeah. Um, if you if you Google me, I'm at um, I'm at Marie Ross at Auckland AC NZ. You can find my email. It's on my um, university contact page, and I've got an email address. Uh, no, not website address. It's marieross.info, and um, I think all the, all the CD links and everything are up there, and uh, all my contact information is there. So thank you so much. And I've got a podcast as well where I talk about this stuff. Um, so in that, the link to the podcast is on my website, marieross.info. Um, it's all there. Thank you so much for having me, Jessica. It's yeah, thank really you. fun.